Hey, what's going on guys? And welcome to the season 6.1 patch notes. Uh, obviously this is the big season six patch that is coming out to really transition season five over into season six. There's a lot of changes and we have a lot to get into. So with these patch notes, there are actually some information that we're going to dive into. That's not just items, not just God balance. There's some actual, um, big changes in general for smite to talk about as well. So project Olympus is Smite's big game-changing project where they're working on code and other features for the game to improve. And for those of you guys who don't know, I think just about everyone does, big feature coming through Season 6 is crossplay. So players on Xbox One, the Nintendo Switch, and PC can now play with and against each other in different modes. The ranked game modes will still be by platform. Uh, it looks like apparently Xbox One and Nintendo Switch can play together on ranked, but PC will be PC only. You will not get like PC and Xbox or PC and Switch, which is good. Um, so ranked will be a little bit exclusive. But for casual modes, if you want to, you can leave crossplay on, which will be on by default. And you can play with those other platforms, which gives you uh, better matchmaking, ideally, um, is what should happen. There will be a bigger player base that way. So that's great. For anyone wondering why PlayStation is not on there, Hi-Rez would love for PlayStation to be on there. Unfortunately, Hi-Rez cannot get PlayStation on there because Sony is being a cuck and just doesn't want to let it happen. So... Uh, Sony's kind of blocking that right now, but it's something they do want and unfortunately just can't get. Roll queue is now a thing, and that's pretty awesome. Uh, roll queue is something that you can choose before the mode that you're queuing into, and you select your top two rolls. Matchmaking will try and assign the person with the highest ranking, the highest, uh, the highest rating, the role that they wanted first, and that's basically going to go in kind of the same order as ranked, where the highest MMR player, the highest ELO player, gets put at the top. Is essentially what's going to happen with roles. So if you get two people in the same game that want to jungle first, whoever has the highest rating would get jungle that, and then the other person would get their second role. So that should be good. That's a way to get roles that you want a little bit more. Um, so if you are a jungle main or a solo main and you really don't want to get stuck on support, then you can pick whatever role you'd rather have instead and get set to that instead. So um, that's something that might slow down queue times a little bit, but I don't think it'll really be much of a problem. And keep in mind, this is also going through on Ranked Conquest, which is a big deal as well, since before Ranked Conquest, you could get stuck in some really bad roles. So that'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, besides that, Ranked is going to be reset. TP gain has been increased, allowing players to progress through ranks at a more rapid pace, which I think will be interesting. Um, I think that's really just about it. There's, there's some simple reward stuff. I don't care about this. So basically, obviously there's going to be a soft reset that happens, uh, meaning that, you know, current ranks will be wiped, but you will still have a general, the system will still know kind of where you're at. Um, well, that'll be interesting for the, the switch versus Xbox ranked, but I don't think it'll be much of a problem since, since switch should be like new players. Right. Um, anyways. Um, players will no longer play qualifying games, but will now start in bronze. I think this is a really good way to do it. This is how they did it back in season zero, season one, one of those really early smite. They did this for a little while, and I think that was a great way to do it. Um, it does require more playing for someone like me instead of playing 10 qualifying games and getting put in diamond five automatically since it knows where I'm at. Um, it's going to be, you know, me playing through bronze, through silver, through gold, through plat really, really quickly and then getting put into diamond just by playing more. So um, especially for players that are new to ranked or that are just lower level to begin with, I think this is a better system, but it does kind of slow things down for players like me. It makes us grind a little harder, but I still think it's good. So it's fine. I'm not complaining. Um, besides that, kill bounty adjustments is something that are changing a little bit. I actually don't know how big of a deal this is going to be. I haven't really done the math on it yet, but essentially the idea is... Um, I believe this is for players that are a higher level, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, the, the way it's working is they're making it so when there is a level difference, it will be a bigger difference in kill rewards. So if you are killing someone that is higher level than you, you will be getting a better reward for that kill. Not going to dive into the math, just not worth it. Haven't looked into it in advance, but it's going to be different. It's going to be better. Um, so which should make basically comeback kills more valuable, which is, I think, a good change. This is going to be an interesting one. I'm going to go ahead and put some footage on the screen for you guys, but Totem of Koo is a pretty big change to the Conquest map over on the solo lane side. It's the big spoil that hi has been waiting to reveal for how they're messing with the solo lane, and it'll be interesting to see how this works out. I'm not sure that I'm a big fan of it. I think it's a pretty boring concept, but it is a concept that does help solo lane improve or impact the map, which I think is good. I just don't think this is the best way to do it, but that's just my opinion. 
So Totem of Ku is a neutral objective, a neutral structure that spawns in the beginning of the game, it spawns at one minute, and it respawns every minute after it is taken, after it is killed, essentially. Um, so the way it works is it starts with a base health of 300, and it increases by 250 each time it's taken, so that adds up pretty quick, because again, remember, it's basically, it's theoretically, you kill it at one minute when it spawns, it'll respawn a minute after that, right? So uh, it's going to be spawning close to every minute. You'll probably be spending... Uh, if you just burst it all at once, it might take like 5-10 seconds to kill it. But um, generally it'll take somewhere around at least a minute 10 for it to spawn. And then if you're taking it like a little bit at a time, if you do like a little bit of damage one wave and a little bit of damage the next, then it might be more like every 2 minutes. Um, but the big thing with this objective is when you actually kill it, the team that gets the, gets the totem kill, which works in a divided manner by the way, it works so that if one team um does 275 damage at the 300 hp and another does 50 it doesn't mean the person who did 50 at the end kills it it means that they did 50 the other team did 275 the team that did 275 just needs to do 25 more to kill it the team that did 50 needs to do 250 more to kill it it's it's divided damages essentially to siege it so um it's not something where you can just like ks it you can't just steal it away like you can with a fire giant or something like that you do need to actually do enough damage to uh to take control of it essentially but once you get the kill on the totem uh any enemies that's or any allies that step into their own tower areas gain five percent movement speed 25 mp5 and uh on kill it gets 25 gold for each team member so essentially 125 gold total per kill of the totem theoretically you can kill the totem how many times can you kill it? 14? No, I couldn't really do 14. 13, you could theoretically kill it 13 times. Will you? No, but you theoretically could. So the totem should be able to theoretically give your team, oh, quick maths, 1625, I think? 1625 gold, I'm pretty sure is the number there. Um, which is a lot, which is a lot. And realistically, you might be able to do around 10, which would be 1250 gold. And that's a pretty big impact from the soul lane if you're stomping and taking control of the totem. That's a pretty big deal. But then also, whenever you're stepping in that tower area, you're getting that 25 MP5, 5% movement speed. I think I could be wrong on how that works, but I believe that is how that works. Uh, I did watch the patch notes live. I, that was my impression, but I feel like they didn't explain it super well. But I believe these, these stats come from stepping into the tower region. Okay, so the Conquest minion spawn time is a bit of an interesting change. I think for the most part, it's not going to be a bad thing at all. I think it'll mostly just be good. Um, but we'll see. So what's happening is they are making it so minions now spawn a minute after the game starts instead of the previous one minute 30. Before, almost everyone could agree that there's kind of a little extra time that we didn't really need in Conquest. Um, with that one minute 30, it felt like there really was probably a good 30 seconds at least that we could change the time by. So they're doing that and they're also giving a uh, movement speed boost to players leaving Fountain at the beginning of the game, the very beginning during this minion spawn time that will let them get to locations quickly. Uh, I don't think they said how fast this would be, but I'm assuming it's essentially the uh, the Pyromancer buff, 40% movement speed, I'm assuming. But basically the idea here is let's get the game started a little bit quicker. That's it. That's that's literally all it is. They just want the game to start quicker. I think that's fine. I think the way they approach it is fine. I don't think there's really anything to worry about. Uh, Conquest Gold Fury. This is a big thing. So... The way Gold Fury is going to work is that we are now going to have essentially three Gold Furies. So um, we have the base Gold Fury, and then we have the Oni Gold Fury, and then we have the Primal Gold Fury. So when the Gold Fury spawns, it will be the base Gold Fury. This is the Gold Fury we know, and it just has the simple experience gold reward that you would typically get for your team. But after it dies for the first time, you will get one of two Gold Furies. You'll get either the Oni Gold Fury or the Primal Gold Fury. And with both of these gold furies, I'm actually trying to remember, I think in general, they lowered the gold reward. I think in general, they lowered the gold reward. I think it applies to the base. Spear rewards can the base gold fury. I believe, yeah. So so all the gold furies got the the general um, reward nerfed. I was thinking it might have just been for the, the new two ones, the two new ones. But a little bit of a nerf to gold fury. But then with the Oni gold fury and the primal gold fury, you're getting an additional bonus from the gold fury that depends on which one you're getting so the primal gold fury you will gain five percent increased damage to jungle camps and bosses which is permanent and stacks up to three times and with the um the oni gold fury you get a wave of fire minions in every lane on the next spawn actually is it fire minions i guess it's not actually fire minions sorry sorry i got confused on that when i was going through that on the uh on the stream bonus damage increased bonus health increased 
So it's not technically fire minions, it is buffed minions. My mistake. So you could actually buff this on fire minions, which might be worth it. But basically, it's it's equivalent to, to fire minions to some degree. I don't know if it's a huge... Um, I don't know if it's the exact same, but it's pretty strong. Really big buffs to minions. I'm assuming it'll be basically the same thing. So uh, buffed minions for killing the Oni Gold Fury. And then you get a jungle buff damage increase on Primal Gold Fury, which stacks up to a potential 15%. But you need to kill the Primal Gold Fury three times to do that in one game. That's not going to happen a whole lot. So normally you'll be looking at 5 or 10% total from that. Pyromancer still exists. They didn't they didn't take it away with the totem or anything. They didn't take it away uh, with the addition of the new gold furies. That's still going to be around. They made a small change, but basically it's Pyromancer is still Pyromancer. Fire Giant got some buffs um, as in it is stronger, it is scarier, and it gives you more. Uh, if I remember right, I could be wrong. I think it gives you more. But basically they gave back the magma pool ability to Fire Giant, which I'm trying to think. When was the last time that was in the game? I think that was in Season 4. I think it was still in, in Season 4, but basically the Magma Pool was the little kind of circles that would come up under the the, uh, the gods fighting Fire Giant in the Fire Giant pit area and would do a shitload of damage if you stood on them. Those are in, and they are keeping the rest of the current abilities, which means Fire Giant is getting a decent amount stronger. They're also increasing a lot of the base stats on Enhanced Fire Giant, so while you are getting that Enhanced buff, you are also having a harder time fighting it because it gets more power, more protections, more health. And I think that's it. I guess maybe they didn't... I, I thought they buffed the actual buff you got off of Enhanced FG, but I guess I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I guess I'm just wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, Conquest Jungle Changes, these are pretty small. They actually didn't really explain this during the patch. You'll have to read through these and see if I find anything I hate. But Small Harpies, decreased base health from 150 to 130, increased health per level 55 to 70. Um, yeah, no, they, they vaguely went over these. So the idea here is that they are changing the jungle buffs so that the jungle buffs are going to be tankier in the late game. So that's pretty evident right here, right? They decrease the original base health of Harpies. They slightly increase base magic protection. That was one thing they brought up as well, is that basically camps pretty much didn't have magic protection, so they wanted to give them a little bit. Um, but most importantly, they're increasing the health per level. So in the very beginning spawn, a lot of these buffs are going to be slightly weaker or, or the exact same, but as they level up, they will get stronger because... One thing you guys would have noticed playing and or watching my videos, um, you know, playing yourself and watching the videos, is that there have been a lot of one-shotting camps from a variety of characters. Um, lots of assassins, lots of mages, whoever can pretty easily come at least close to one-shotting camps with at least their main ability, if not others. They're trying to kind of pull that back a little bit and make it more like previous smite, where maybe you could clear the camps pretty quick, but it wasn't as absurd as it is right now. So I think that's a good change. I do think it'll be an interesting change to jungle farming because that will be a nerf to jungle farming and it will therefore be a nerf to junglers. But I do think it's generally a good change and we'll just have to see if they make other changes in order to make up for that, like if they buff the XP and gold you get from camps or anything like that. Um, let's see, gold fury changes as well being listed here. Um, slightly nerfing gold fury damage is interesting. Um basically pretty small change slightly nerfing gold fury damage and then increasing the scaling on gold fury damage so early game gold fury not quite as strong it looks like all right so now we're on to item balance for those of you who still play dual or who play casual modes attacker's blessing is getting a pretty decent nerf increasing stacks required to evolve from 50 to 100 that 10 penetration you get off of evolving attacker's blessing is absolutely insane to have on a starter item 10 pen Pen in general is one of the most valuable stats in the game, and getting 10 off of a 700 gold item is ridiculous, and then getting 20 power on top of that is also ridiculous, and getting that 10 pen within one wave in a duel game is even more ridiculous. So they're nerfing it to 100. This is still going to be a very strong item. This is still very much going to be worth picking up, but it is going to be a little less OP is basically what it is. Uh, and then uh guardian's blessing or defender's blessing increased stacks a bit as well from 50 to 75 so not quite as steep but still a bit and then also upgrading the um the evolved form so it's from 100 to 150 which is a decent buff there as well and then also buffing specialist blessing increasing the mp5 and increasing the stacks required to evolve so a lot of these ones they're trying to make them better but they also want to keep the the evolve time a little bit in touch with the attacker's blessing which is funny because attackers are still going to stack before all these but whatever 
All right, Warrior's Blessing is getting a buff. I hate it. I wish they didn't. I wish they'd take it out of the game, but I get they want to have one per roll. Um, Warrior's Blessing is going from 30 to 40 health and mana you restore on each proc of the passive, and it's also getting a slight buff to the evolved bonus protections. Uh, I hate Warrior's Blessing. I think it's a terrible item. I don't think it should exist in the game. I think that getting um, a good chunk of HP and mana off of abilities is really boring, and it made the soul lane very boring, and soul lane is already boring right now, even when it's not very meta to build Warrior's Blessing. It's only somewhat meta. It's only like it's only getting a little bit of play. So I don't want this to be in the game. It is. It's unfortunate, but it's getting a buff and it's going to be better. So <laughs> that's that's my thoughts on it. Um, Horrific Emblem is getting some nerfs, which might confuse some of you guys. Horrific Emblem has definitely shown up to be a strong relic at some of the, the recent competitive events. I think that is getting a little overrated personally, a little overhyped, but uh, it's getting nerfed either way, so it's decreased the slow from 40 to 30%, decreased the attack and beat slow from 20 to uh, 25 to 15%, and then on the upgrade, you still have it down to 30%, but the attack speed slow will buff up to 25%, and the decreased damage dealt debuff from 20 is going down to 15, and this is the big reason that I think some people are sleeping on with Horrific Emblem being, being strong, is that you're getting a big damage debuff to enemy characters, so uh, even though you're getting the slow, which is somewhat cleansable, the big thing is that you're decreasing a lot of enemy damage for a decent amount of time, and that's really the biggest thing to nerf. I think, if anything, this is what they should have focused on and not really mess with the slow, personally, but that's just me. Consumables, this is a big one. Elixir of Speed is going to seriously mess with the late game of Smite. Personally, and I think I'll dive into this right after we go through it, I think this is a bad change. I think I'm very one of the very few people who believes that. But we'll look into why in just a second. So Elixir Speed costs 2,000 gold. It is a consumable that increases movement speed by 18% permanently, but this effect does not stack with movement speed from boots or from shoes. And it lasts basically infinite minutes. And it doesn't, it doesn't die with you or anything like that. You just you buy it, you keep it. So the way this works is what it means by it does not stack is if you have boots, this does not make you faster. If you have this plus boots, you do not get any bonus movement speed. This is meant to be purchasable boots without taking up an item slot. What this does is it gives you a better late game on a lot of characters you'd rather have a different item. Um, if you're a tank, you'd rather have another tank item. If you're a mage, you'd rather have another damage item. If you're an assassin, you varies, but <laughs> you know, it, a lot of roles, you get another damage, you get another tank item, whatever it is that fits your role. And this makes late game a little more late game. But the reason I have a problem with this is two things. For one thing, it makes late game a little more late game, which makes ADCs even stronger. It makes mages even stronger. And it rewards them with keeping that movement speed that they would, you know, need from boots before, right? So that's a really important thing for them is that they can keep that movement speed and then they can just be ridiculous. You know, they can buy an extra rod of Tahuti. They can buy an extra Deathbringer. They can get a lot of really important items on characters that scale really hard in a meta that was already late game. In a meta where warriors were already falling off, where um, assassins were starting to fall off, guardians still existed because guardians can deal with them better and they have better CC options. But a lot of the more bruisery characters, which kind of fall into both warriors and assassins, were starting to struggle pretty hard. And now they're going to struggle that much harder as we get into the late game. I also dislike the idea of putting in something that just gives you movement speed as if you need that movement speed. That's something that personally I've already disliked about Smite for a while. Uh, <laughs> whoops, we're gonna turn that off. I didn't realize that was on. Uh, apparently someone followed the Twitch. I'm not streaming. Um, but what I was gonna say was that I don't think that it's good to have a necessity for this movement speed. The idea that you need the movement speed from boots to be that sort of late game build what high res I think should instead be striving for is can we create a game balanced enough that you don't need 18% movement speed to buy a full damage build or whatever it may be, right? You can get away with not building movement speed is what I think it should be. And I don't think this is a good solution personally, but it's in the game. Late game is getting buffed. Hyper carries are getting buffed. Um, and that's going to be really big for mages, really big for hunters and a few assassins as well but mostly just the really strong late game hyper carry style assassins that do lots of damage like Mercury. Doom Orb is getting some changes. Uh, I actually don't remember exactly what these are. Let's check it out. So first off, Cursed Orb is essentially replacing current Doom Orb as a tier two item. Uh, so it's going to have 55 power, 75 mana, 20 MP5. Wait, what? 
20 to, I guess it's 15 MP5. I don't know why they wrote it that way. I don't know why they just, it's literally a new item. Just write it. Okay, whatever. 3% uh, <laughs> movement speed and essentially do more passive, right? Uh, essentially do more passive right there. New Doom Orb is a lot of money, 3,200 gold. It gives you 135 power. This is a tier, tier 3 item, by the way. Uh, 200 mana, 25 MP5, 6% movement speed, and killing or assisting an enemy minion provide you with one stack, granting 1% movement speed and 6 magical power per stack. Stacks last for 15 seconds and stack up to 5 times. So, essentially, you can get 5% um, movement speed and 30 power per stack here. Uh, or not per stack, sorry, total, which would be 165 power and 11% uh, movement speed is what you would get on top of that as well. Okay, so uh, slight nerf to Book of Souls, which is the tier 2 for Book of Thoth, Book of the Dead, and all those items. Going down to 55 power, not a big deal. Book of Thoth is getting a small rework, essentially. Um, it's getting nerfed in cost a little bit, or sorry, buffed in cost a little bit, those, those terms, man. Uh, so it's a little bit cheaper now, but they are changing the passive so that while you are getting more mana off of the magical power that you have, um, or sorry, you're getting more magical power off of the mana that you have, you are not getting that off of your base mana, you are only getting that off of mana from items. So what that means is, um, for a lot of mages that are building this and are getting a thousand plus mana from just their character's natural base mana, that no longer affects Book of Thoth. So this is more an item that you want to be building with other actual mana items, and that will therefore kind of nerf it for the most part, but in certain builds will still be strong. I'm I'm not really sure why they felt the need to do this. I think it's probably a good change just to try and make base mana costs less of an impact on the item. So theoretically, this is now a little more fair to Guardians, I guess. But I don't know. I think it's a little bit weird. It, it's fine. It's mostly going to stay the same, but it should be a slight nerf overall to Book of Thoth for the most part. Uh, enemies, sorry, I started reading the description. Soul Reaver. Enemies that get hit by Soul Reaver's bonus damage will take 50% less damage from this effect on subsequent hits. So essentially, Soul Reaver is getting diminishing returns, uh, which means that when you are hitting Soul Reaver for the first time, you will do the normal Soul Reaver damage. When you hit Soul Reaver again within three seconds, it will be doing less damage. Uh, I don't believe this scales. From, from what I could tell, this doesn't scale. So it should be um, you're getting whatever percent damage based on their health from Soul Reaver. Let's say just for, for easy sake, uh, 2%. Um, so you get a 2% shot from Soul Reaver, then you get 50% if you hit within 3 seconds, which is 1%, and if you hit again within 3 seconds, it should still be 1%, is I believe how that'll work. If it scales down, which it shouldn't, but it could theoretically if they're dumb, then that's going to be a really hard nerf. I believe it is just linear, I believe it's just kind of a little, little quick drop down in damage. Uh, the idea here is to just kind of nerf Soul Reaver on the really crazy burst characters like Agni, who go... Three bombs, plus gas, plus wave, five abilities, maybe even a dash, six, boom, and just blow up all that damage. Plus, I guess it's passive procs it too, doesn't it? Um, so, yeah, they're trying to nerf that side of Soul Reaver. The thing is, three seconds is almost any mage combo. So, I don't think they did a great job with it. I don't think they really thought it through that much. I think they should just change the way the item works, personally. But yeah, they're basically nerfing Soul Reaver realistically this is a nerf to anybody buying soul reaver but it kind of matters a little more to certain characters i i don't know why they did it this way I, it's, I think it's kind of a stupid way to nerf it but it's nerfed obsidian sharp is getting a slight nerf they increased the cost up 150 gold to 2300 they gave it a little bit of power uh this is a close to non-existent change but it is a change it's not a big nerf they buffed the power a little bit to make up for it i don't know why um, Obsidian Charge is close to the same, it's just slightly more expensive, essentially. Typhon's Fang is getting a buff, increased magical life steal from 10% to 15%, not a big deal, but makes the item a little bit better. Dynasty Plate Helm got a little quality of life buff as well, going from 45 to 55 power, so a little bit stronger there as well. Stone of Binding got a decent change, so this item is now going from magic power of 20 to 30, and it has a slightly reworked passive, so that successfully hitting an enemy god with crowd control will place a debuff on the enemy's hit and the debuff is decreased protections by 15. So before it would give enemies, or sorry, allies in your in your area, I don't remember how big the aura was, but around you, it would give allies 10 when you hit a crowd control. Now it's making it so the enemies you actually hit will be debuffed by those protections, right? So um, for the most part, this just makes it a more reliable item if you are crowd controlling the enemy you're trying to focus down, as you generally will, 
then it's going to work a little bit better because any any allies that might be out of range of that aura you would have before are still going to be able to do that bonus damage because they're going to be straight up losing those protections. So really it just makes the item make a little bit more sense. But it is a little bit of a change. For certain situations, it could be a nerf. Generally, I think it'll be a buff. Oh boy. Malice is something that I think a lot of people are sleeping on. Uh, I think this is actually going to be a really big change. But people don't seem to know about it yet. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So Malice is getting a new passive for like the fifth time. Its new passive is that when it's successfully hitting an enemy, sorry, whenever you successfully hit an enemy with a critical strike, you will subtract two seconds from your ability's cooldowns, except for your ultimate. This effect can happen once every five seconds. So let's go ahead and put this in a better situation. Let's say you have a late game crit build, and that crit build is even stronger because you buy the movement speed pot. So you don't have boots, you have another crit item that you would not have before. Um, and you are in a fight, you're doing different stuff, you're throwing out cooldowns, and you're auto-attacking, right? You're an ADC, that's what you do. So, throwing out cooldowns, auto-attack, malice proc, okay? So you just lost two seconds off your cooldowns, need to wait another five seconds. Hey, you're still fighting after five seconds, malice proc. So within about five to six seconds, you can cut off four seconds worth of cooldowns off of your abilities because you get that second proc immediately, right? Uh, it's really easy to think of this as being two seconds every ten, realistically the impact is more like four seconds every six or sorry I, I meant to say four every ten it's more like four every six in a lot of fights especially with an actual crit build so that is really high potential that is going to be a lot of the time around 40 percent cooldown reduction or just it depends on the cooldowns you have but a really high amount of cooldown reduction off of a crit item that did not have cooldown reduction so Potentially very, very strong. Um, little example, I don't actually know the Apollo Mez cooldown off the top of my head, but this is what I was thinking about, is if you're fighting aggressively as Apollo, and let's say your Mez is at a 12 second cooldown, that's just a guess, um, and, and you're fighting really aggressively. So you Mez, you know, maybe you get a little like engagement from the assassin on the enemy team, Mez them off, re-engage, go fight some other people. And over those few seconds, let's say six seconds that you're fighting those other people, that Mez cooldown goes from 12 to 6. You get two Malice procs, it goes down to two. So you're getting a really big cooldown reduction buff in the middle of a fight. And within those other two seconds, your Mez comes back up again. So really high potential item. It will not always stand out. It depends on the fight. If you are getting in very bursty engagements, you will not get the proc more than once, and that will make it pretty low impact. But in longer engagements, it's going to be really high impact. So um, just, just going to vary a little bit, but it's a way to get a lot of kind of free cooldown reduction on a crit item, which is high value. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think it's going to be OP, but I don't know how much people are going to realize how to use it. So we'll see. Poison Star, getting a nerf, good. Increased cost from 2400 to 2500. Decrease the critical strike chance from 20% to 15%. Uh, pretty decent nerf. Poison Star, pretty consistently OP. They're nerfing it again. They they like to go through this thing lately of like they nerf it and they're like, I don't know, man. Poison Star is just a decent item now. Let's buff it. And then Poison Star becomes OP again and they nerf it. Now we're at the nerf, <laughs> nerf stage again. So wait till they buff it again. Uh, Wind Demon is getting a buff to try and compete a little better with Poison Star. So it's going from 2700 to 2600 gold. Not a huge deal, but it's a little something. Oboe is getting a buff. High res is going to be afraid of me, man. Watch me make this item OP. Increased basic attack power scaling on the passive from 50% to 60%. I believe Oboe is actually really underrated already. I think a lot of people just forget the item exists on a lot of characters that can use it well or in a build that can use it well. So uh, I thought it was already actually really solid. They, they buffed it. So watch out for Vimana ADC 2019, boys. Uh, Silver Branch Bow, got a buff, that's okay, it's a joke anyways, we'll just ignore Silver Branch Bow, no one buys that thing, if you do, you shouldn't, Runic Shield, increased health from 100 to 150, by the way, if anyone actually has, if you actually want to know why Silver Branch is bad, just leave a comment down below, I'll try and respond to you guys, uh, if there are other comments, I will not respond to all of them, but I don't want to go over it in the video, I can go over it in the comments, Silver Branch is trash, it pretty much always will be, unless they make it just stupid, like super stupid in stats. Uh, high res hates me. They, they nerfed Angele. I'm sad. I love this item. They made it 150 gold more. Uh, I think that is absolutely fair though. I think Angele costs too little. That's part of why I liked it so much. So it was 2000 gold for some insane stats. Passive or not, the stats were really, really good for the price. They nerfed that a little bit. 
Uh, Cudgel got a kind of buff. They they decrease health, increase power. Probably a buff. Um, Shalalag, which is the tier two for Blackthorn. I don't think I said that right. Tier two for Blackthorn Hammer got a bit of a buff because it sucked before. So yeah. Uh, and then Blackthorn Hammer got a bit of a buff as well. So it has now increased the power from 25 to 35. Decent buff. And the passive now makes a little more sense, whereas before you would get 10% cooldown when you're above 50% health, and then the 50 MP5 when you're below 50% health. It is now when you're below 25% mana, or... Sorry, I said health. I meant mana uh, before with that stuff. Now when you're at 25 instead of 50%, you're getting the mana regen, which makes it more valuable, right? Because you don't need mana until you get low on mana. And it's a ton of MP5 you get off that item. So that's a bit of a buff to it as well. Runeforge is getting a fat buff. Increased physical power from 40 to 55. That is almost a 50% increase on the physical power. Decreased health by 50 from 250 to 200. Not that big of a deal. This is a really good buff for Runeforge. Its problem was it was not an aggressive enough item to be worth picking up. It actually might be now. So uh, I think Runeforge is something we'll be building in some upcoming builds in Season 6. Gauntlet of Thebes increased the health a bit. Gauntlet of Thebes has kind of dropped off lately. So they're increasing it from 200 to 275. Decent buff. Stone of Gaia is getting a buff, so the speed that you get the passive cooldown, or the passive heal, I should say, uh, goes from 10 to 5 seconds, so you're getting that heal twice as fast now, which is pretty good. And then they decrease the cooldown from 60 to 45, so that you're getting that heal more often as well in those matchups where you could use it. Shield of Regrowth got a little bit of a buff, so you increase HP 5, increase MP 5, and increase the cost by 100 gold. Not a big deal. Still going to be about the same, but it's a little bit better. Uh, Spectral Armor increased physical, pr physical protection from 60 to 70. Decent and then decreased damage dealt from critical strikes from 60 to 50. Uh, so, wait. They they put that in the wrong order. From 50 to 60. So basically, you're now getting less damage taken from crits, which means the item is stronger. They they wrote it weird, but that's what it is. I remember it from the patch. So, yeah. Uh, so it's stronger anti-crit item now. Lono's Mask is getting a bit of a nerf. Thank God. Increased damage dealt from... Increased, decreased damage dealt... High res, write your thing right from 20 to 25%. So you do even less damage. You do even less healing from Lono's Mask now because it was still getting picked up a little more than they liked, I think, on certain characters. Make it a little less rewarding. Uh, Rangda's Mask is now increasing the ability damage dealt from 15 to 20%. You already had 20% increased auto attack damage. Now they're making an increased 20% ability damage. This is a little bit to make the uh, description more simple and the item more self-explanatory, but I think it's also just a good change. I think it makes sense to have it both ways, make it a little less auto-attack focused. I don't know why they did that to begin with, but they did, so I think it's a good change. Uh, Bumba's got a little bit of a buff as well, increasing the power a tiny bit from 20 to 30, and from 50 to 65. Oh my god, I need to breathe. Oh, okay, this is a long patch, boys. This is a long patch. The Warrior class. Increase the base HP of all Warriors by 10. Increase the base HP per level of all Warriors by 3. So essentially, level 20, every Warrior will now have 75 more health, and it will slowly scale to that point in between then. Is it a huge buff? No, but it is a buff to take note of for all Warriors. It makes them a bit stronger. Uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of the time, this will mean that you can survive an extra auto attack or something like that, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's something. It's definitely there. It's just, it's not a huge deal, but it's there. It's there. It's a good change. Uh, AMC getting a buff. Decrease the cooldown on his two from 16 to 12 to 15 to 11. So one second change. And decrease the mana cost on his honey from 75 to 95 down to 60 at all ranks. Anubis is getting a pretty good buff. Increasing the stun duration on his two from 1.2 to 2 to 1.6 to 2. Basically meaning that he starts with a 0.4 second stronger stun and making it less incentive, or creating less incentive to max the two after his three, and instead max the one instead. That's a pretty strong change. Um, pretty strong buff for Anubis. He is still Anubis, so he probably won't be meta, but it's a pretty strong buff for him, and if you do play Anubis, congratulations. If you are a dual main, I am sorry. If you are an Anubis dual main, you're welcome. Uh, Alquang, passive rework. Uh, his new passive, I didn't understand this during the patch. We're going to read this out. Dragon King Sword. Every 20 seconds, Ao Kuang gets a stack of Dragon King Sword. As long as he has a stack, his next non-ultimate ability that deals damage to an enemy god will consume a stack to have its cooldown reduced by 2 seconds and heals Ao for 5% of his max HP. Successfully executing an enemy god with King of the Eastern Seas fully charges Dragon King Sword. This effect can stack up to 3 times. Okay, so. Uh, every minute, Ao Kuang gets 3 stacks of this passive. Every stack reduces the cooldown on his next hit, successful hit of an ability, right? 
yeah, his, his successful hit on an enemy god and reducing that cooldown by two seconds. So you can save these up a little bit and reduce the cooldown on your three, two, and one by two seconds each in a burst engagement. Theoretically, you could do that, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then you can also use his ultimate to charge that passive back up. So, so basically, Al Huang is getting more cooldown reduction. And if you're smart about how you use that passive, you can use it a little bit better. So I think that's a decent change. Uh, keep in mind that is replacing his old passive. So even though that might seem like a strong buff, keep in mind it's an instant replacement of what he had before, which is giving him decent sustain. So I think this is probably a little better, but it's going to be, it's not going to be a huge deal. It's not going to be a huge deal. Bacchus. Oh, oh, if you guys are Bacchus players, or if you want to be Bacchus players, you should be excited about this change. Chug is now available at level one, kind of like Uller Ult or Tears Stance Switch. It is just available. It's there, and it has a rank zero to use. Does not provide protections at rank zero. It does cost 35 mana, and Chug now provides 40% drunk meter at all ranks. What does that mean? It means Bacchus can now actually get drunk and use his passive starting at level one, and he can Chug up in base and not worry about the mana yet. So that's a pretty big deal for Bacchus. Um... That means he actually gets a stun at level one if he gets his belch. And just in general, it gives him the, the damage mitigation and power of his passive that he can just actually start with. And that's something that Bach has struggled with. For one thing, he had to put a point in his chug early on in the game, which kind of sucked for him because he didn't want to put a chug in it yet. So that made him a little bit weaker in fights. And then he also, um, he didn't have his passive, which made him a weaker character. He didn't have that mitigation. He didn't have that power. Now he will be able to have access to that as well. So that's a really good buff for Bacchus. I'm excited, and I'm glad that they finally made that change because that has been due for like five years. Uh, Bastet got a little bit of a buff to her too. Increased power scaling from 20 to 25%. Decreased mana cost on her three by a good bit. A uh, little bit of like quality of life change, but not a big deal for, for Bastet. Not going to make her meta or anything like that. Um, Baron is getting some nerfs, so they decrease the bonus heal of his two, which was based on the missing health from 12.5 to 10%. So 20% decrease there. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, and then life of the party decreased total health damage from 15 to 10%, which is a pretty big deal as well. Uh, both those pretty solid nerfs to Baron, who is very strong and will continue to be strong, but decent solid nerfs. We will see how those play out. Uh, High res finally realized that Bologna ult does zero damage at rank one and decided to buff it. So uh, Eagles rally increased base damage from 100 to 500 to 140 to 500. Some of you guys might be like, why? Bologna's already too strong. Bologna ult is actually garbage at rank one. It is so bad. It is so bad. You only really get it for mobility and a stun. That's pretty much it. It does so little damage. So I'm, I personally like the change. I personally like it. As someone that's not a Bologna main, but has played her a decent amount lately, like I, I've definitely noticed how little that ability does. I think it's a good change for her. And it still does the same decent amount at rank five, which is good. Kabrak and ult has gotten a better hitbox, which gives him a little more range to hit. Uh, basically, the way this works now is that it actually expands out to the sides of the walls, right? Expand the hit area of this ability to damage all gods in the entire rectangle shape in front of Kabrakin. Yes, so it, it basically reaches uh, directly in front of him so that you had this thing before where, like, if they weren't far enough from you, you wouldn't hit the damage, which is stupid. And I think maybe also if they were too far to the side. So basically, his ultimate is now easier to hit is essentially what they're saying. It has a better hitbox, so if you're Kabrakin main and you didn't always hit his ultimate, you pretty much will now. All right, Kamazots. Uh, the buff from Vampire Bats now lasts from uh, 210 to 300 seconds, so that's longer, and it persists through death. So basically that passive of vampirism that he wants to keep up and can't if he is either dying a lot or just maybe not getting the, the cooldown often enough, not getting those buffs killed often enough with the passive then he can now keep it up pretty easily. So that's a decent quality of life buff for Kamazots, making his passive more reliable. Um, that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. So it makes him a little more reliable, which is solid. CERN is getting some decent buffs as well. Decrease the cooldown on his ultimate from 100 to 90 and increase the base damage on his two from 40 to 200 to 60 to 200. Uh, I'm sure you guys who have played some CERN know that his two is absolute garbage right now at rank one as far as, uh, as, far as clear. So they buff that a little bit. It'll be a little bit better now. Fafnir, for you guys who are weirdos and like to build a mage, he is getting a buff to his dragon breath from 20 to 40 to 20 to 60. Um, that is a pretty decent buff in the late game, going up a solid 50% in damage, uh, base damage that is. So, yeah, if you're one of those guys in duel that goes Fafnir, 
Uh, congratulations, you do more damage now. Hera is getting a nerf. Thank God Argus increased cooldown from 70 to 90. Um, Hera is a pretty good god right now. And Argus is weird in that Argus himself is like pretty bad. But the, the ability that drops him on your face is pretty insanely good because it does a lot of damage and it gives a really strong CC. So, and it's a huge area. So, uh, good to nerf that. Good to nerf that. You can use Argus way too often, especially considering her ultimate, or not her ultimate, her passive gives her more cooldown reduction to use Argus more often. That's a really big change. And it's a good one. Hercules, they decrease the cooldown on his ultimate. I honestly, I don't exactly get why. Um, but okay. I, I think just they wanted to buff him. They didn't really know how, so they buffed his ultimate. That's fine, I guess. Uh, but Hercules gets a little bit stronger. Gets to throw that rock a little more often. Um, uh, I... <laughs> Some people are really butthurt about this. Some people are really excited about this. Isis is getting a huge buff to her three. Uh, increased range from 40 to 55. So this is almost a 50% increase in range, which is huge. For those of you guys who have played Isis at all or played against her at all, you probably know her three doesn't have a whole lot of range. Now it does. Um, that's really valuable for making her spirit ball more reliable without having to get into a weird kind of close range engagement because not only does her three shred protections, but it also slows. And before you had this weird thing where, you know, Spirit Ball does more damage the farther it goes, but you wanted to get close enough to your three before the two so that you could more reliably hit the two, right? Um, so now you can do that at range, which is a really big buff for Isis. She's also getting a slight range increase to her ultimate. That's not going to be as big of a deal, though. King Arthur got lots of fixes. The biggest thing that I noticed was being that he has, uh, a lot of you guys have probably noticed this as well, that he has a jitter issue with his auto attacks, especially on higher ping. Um... And they fixed all these issues, including that one. Or at least they, they tried to. I think I think they did. We'll have to confirm ourselves, right? Uh, and then also increase the energy gain on his one from one to two per hit. I think that's his one, right? Twin Cleave, Blade Storm. No, that's his three, isn't it? I guess that's his three, right? I think that's his three. Increase the energy gain from one to two per hit. And then on Sundering Strike, decrease the charge range from 16 to 12. So I don't know exactly what that means. But it means something. I think that means... Yeah, I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I think that just means it goes a little bit farther with his dash. I don't know. Loki. I don't really get the first change here. Um, I mean, I do, but I don't. But let's go ahead and look into it. So Loki got the damage progression on his auto attacks change from what it was before. One, half, 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 one and a half to three quarters, half, 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 one and a half. So Loki's initial autos which you use very, very heavily for auto-canceling on Loki, are getting a good nerf of doing a quarter less damage than they did before. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not a big Loki fan. Um, mostly just because people play him like a little bitch. But this is not the play. This is not the change. I don't know why they did this. I think this is terrible. I think no god should ever do less than normal damage on their original auto-attacks unless they have weird-as-hell auto-attacks and they has no reason to have those. So, I don't get it. But, they did this, it's through, it's there. So, Loki mains, you got nerfed somewhat hard. This is basically, they might as well have just nerfed Hydras on Loki by like a good 30%, or a good 25% of the Hydras procs, is, is really what that's close to. Is it's like, uh, on all other gods, Hydras now does 50%, or does 50% bonus damage on autos. On Loki, it only does 25%, is kind of what they're doing. But you don't, you know, you don't need Hydras for that effect to, to take effect. So it's actually a pretty big nerf because um, he does rely on auto canceling so hard, especially at a higher level. But it's it's there. It's through. They also removed the damage mitigation on Invis. Fucking finally, dude. Why do you have 20% da 25% damage mitigation on an invisibility that you have to CC to break? Like, really? Really? But they finally took it away. So that's good. A uh, little baby buff to, to Sickle Strike for Osiris goes up 10 damage at all ranks. And then a little baby buff to his two as well, going up five damage at all ranks. Uh, I don't I don't know why. I, I don't know why. It's a little bit of a buff. I don't know if there's like any specific reason they did it just a little baby bit or not. Uh, Pele getting a little bit of a nerf, thank God. They decreased the power from two uh, per level to one, which is a pretty decent nerf for Pele, meaning she gets 20 less power out of her passive late game. And then also decrease the duration of her passive from 6 seconds to 4 seconds, which is a pretty big deal as well. Uh, Poseidon got some bonus physical protection. Apparently he was lacking that. I, I don't know why, but he was. So they buffed it from 2.2 to 2.6, which means that through 20 levels, he should be getting uh, 8 protections, right? Yeah, 8 protections through 20 levels. 
which is a decent amount. You know, it's like a tier one item. Not even a tier one item. It's, it's something. It's something. Uh, Thoth got some big changes, some big juicy changes. I don't play Thoth at all, but for those of you who do, you'll definitely want to know about this. So Hieroglyphic Assault got changed from 40 to 120 damage to 45 to 125 damage. Uh, that's his three. Um, that is not a big deal at all. It's a very small buffer, Thoth. His two got some big changes. So his two no longer stuns. It does pierce through enemies, including gods, and it will root the first god hit and slow any other enemy hit. The root and slow both last for 1.5 seconds, and the slow is at 30%. So this is re reverting Thoth a little bit to his original release, where he slowed on his two instead. Um, it's a pretty big nerf to his two for the most part, but it also makes his two a little bit stronger as a damaging ability. So we'll have to see. It's going to be a little situational. Um, they made up for this nerf by buffing his ultimate scaling from 100 to 120%. That's a pretty big buff. But basically, Thoth's two is a little less cancerous for anyone playing against Thoth, but it's also a little more skill reliant and a little stronger if you aim it really, really well and hit multiple enemies. So uh, we'll kind of have to see with that how it plays out. I think it's a good change. Whether it's overall a buff or a nerf, I'm not totally sure yet. I think it's a little bit of a nerf still. But Thoth relies really heavily on his ultimate. He still he still gets that buff to his ultimate, so that's a big deal. Zeus is getting some changes. I don't even remember if these were overall a buff or a nerf. But Aegis Assault, his two, gets cooldown increased from 10 to 12. Detonate Charge increased damage from 55 to 135 to 60 to 180. So pretty big buff on his three, right? Increase the magical power scaling from 18% to 25%. Again, a pretty big buff to his three. But they reduce the multiplication on his three from one to three per charge to one to 2.4. So essentially what they're doing here is they're making his three more reliable with fewer charges and making it less important to stack those up is, is really the idea that they're going for here with Zeus three is that you can get a little more damage off of just one charge is, is really the big idea. Um, and then Lightning Storm adjusted the damage from 120 to 200 to 100 to 220. So a little less early game damage, which is good. And then a little more late game damage and also increasing the scaling by 5% on Lightning Storm, which is his ultimate. That is the patch. It was a long one. Hopefully this video did not last an hour. I think it came close. It looks like it came close. But thank you guys for, for uh, going through it all with me. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you have questions, feel free to leave them down below. And hopefully either someone else who knows or, or I myself can give you an answer for it. But that is the patch, guys. Season 6 is coming out soon. Uh, I believe PTS is coming out pretty much exactly a week from now. And I'm personally pretty excited. There aren't huge changes. Just like normal, the even season is going to be pretty similar to the odd season before it. And just try and improve on it. So far, I think that they're partially improving on it. But I am very afraid of how late game the meta will become with that speed potion. So uh, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. And I will see you all in the next one.